You're listening to the Brave Parent Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Susan Maples. I'm here for all parents who deeply love their children and want their health span to equal their lifespan. In other words, to be healthy their entire lives. If that's you, tune in. In every episode, we're grappling with contemporary issues that affect every child every day in areas that your doctors either don't know or don't have time to tell you. It's your time to be brave. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the Brave Parent Podcast Season 2. Today, Lauren and I have the pleasure of being with a uh, very close friend and colleague of mine who has has been instrumental in not only my knowledge and development of airway and airway disorders, but also is a mover and a shaker with uh, in terms of policy. And I will, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. He practices adult sleep medicine as a dentist and is an author of a book called Dental Sleep Medicine, which has been a big evidence-based um, contribution to our profession. Um, also is really keen on the whole project of collaboration cures, bridging the gap between medicine and and dentistry. And also uh, is part of our Endeavor Group, which is an international group of um, men and women, uh, again, around the globe that are really pushing forward an agenda of making sure that um, at some point in our life, maybe in our lifetime, I don't know, each dentist who sees kids will be looking for airway disorders and be able to spot them earlier and treat them. And Lauren knows something about that because she's been involved in crusading for her children as she read Brave Parent and learned that her kids had airway disorders. So um, Steve, who doesn't see kids, is literally pushing the agenda with the American Dental Association and has put our profession really in the limelight for, for you know, in really at the front row of being able to uh, position, uh, you know, all of medicine to look at us to be the gateway, the gatekeepers for pediatric airway. And we'll talk about why that is and how it comes to pass. And we can ask anything of Steve, um, Lauren, in the, in the area of breathe chapter or sleep. So, uh, functional development and or sleep related breathing disorders. We're not going to talk a lot about sleep hygiene today, but we'll talk about, we can talk about anything on the progression from normal, healthy breathing through upper airway resistance syndrome, snoring, any of that and, and flow limitations of any kind. And then all the way to severe OSA and how do we address that earlier? So Steve, did I miss anything in your introduction? I thought we were going to talk about, you know, music and vinyl records and things like that. So, so I guess we'll have to come up with something else. That'll be next that's, time. That's uh, very we'll generous of you, Stress Susan. reduction for kids. <laughs> the audience, Susan and I have known each other a long time. We're very close friends, so we can kid around a lot. But, but what she says is so true. Dentistry has uh, the opportunity and the obligation to take its place in the uh, presence of little kids and helping them uh, start their life off much better than anybody else is helping them at this point. Because the uh, medical profession sees little kids as, as uh, you know, collections of health and disease, and they ad address the disease issues, but they don't see the little kids as a potential of growth and development and the impact of what seemingly is a, an ordinary process of the child's breathing. So they're living, right? So that we can see that happening. So what else should we worry about? That that box is checked. Let's move on. And what dentistry can do is we can actually do the right diagnosis, which is growth and development issues. It's not about whether they can breathe. breathe. It's about how well they breathe and how well they breathe sets the stage for so many other things. But it's hard to quantify. And so the, di the diagnosis isn't really about how well they breathe. The diagnosis is what do we can we do to allow the body to be as healthy as possible? And so many kids have a restriction in that upper airway. And if they have that, if they're growing with that, and for whatever reason they are, then there's no way that that body is going to be as healthy as it can be. And as we think about how that three-year-old, that two-year-old, that infant, that five-year-old uh, is um, able 
to use their structure to be as healthy as possible, it becomes a structural diagnosis, it becomes a habit diagnosis. Of, uh, so we have structure and function to be concerned about. And Interesting habits. Habits are a part of it too, and in, in the sense that you could get, you know, we're all about uh, eliminating mouth breathing. We want 24 seven. How often should you be breathing through your mouth? about as often as you eat through your nose, just like never. But this is the backup valve and you can slump, the kids can slump in to a mouth breathing habit just by having a really good cold and then not break out of that. And it's up to us to watch that and as parents and sort of jump in and say, uh-oh, we've got a problem. How are we gonna fix this mouth breathing habit? And one of the things, Steve, um, I'm always curious about, and I don't know where you are with, uh, where we are with the research on it, but there's this whole idea called nasal disuse, where we know that the back of the throat, uh, you know, the tonsils get lit larger and the adenoids get larger when you're breathing through your mouth. We don't like that. That crowds that the airway. But what about the fact that our noses get like more puffy in there and more snotty in there, and they become literally less useful to us when we stop it's sort of like use it or lose it. We don't understand it. Do you, what, what can you tell us about nasal disuse? Yeah, there's a couple of things that are really critical about that that I've learned over the past few years. A uh, ear, nose, and throat doctor did a fascinating research project where he simulated a nose and he found out that when we breathe through our mouths, there's a constant little negative pressure in our noses. And so that small amount of vacuum or, no, or negative pressure, what it does is it pulls the tissue away from the supporting bone. Ah. So it pulls that, that soft uh, moldable tissue away from the supporting structures of the nose and the sinuses and things, further crowding the airway, making it more resistive to flow. That's that fascinating. Is, isn't that interesting? And it's, it, so he explains how, how back thro uh, tonsils get bigger, how the adenoids get bigger, how septums swell up and all the things that are in the way when we breathe. The second person I've learned a ton from is Patrick McCowan, who's kind of our global breathing coach. And, and Patrick talks about how when you uh, disuse the tissue, when you don't flow air past these very functional tissues inside the nose, well, their function says, well, I, I'll take a break today. I'm not, I'm not being used. And so I'm not going to need to be as toned up as I should be. It's like any other part of our body. If we don't use it, it kind of falls into a bit of a lack of tone, a lack of readiness. And so if we don't breathe through our nose, it's not ready for us to breathe through our nose. And that backup, like you said, our emergency valve uh, becomes the easy way for it to happen. Then the cycle just completes uh, circles around and around. And that nasal disuse syndrome takes heart, which it makes it harder to breathe through the nose. And so reestablishing the nose breathing habit once it's gone away is now becomes challenging. Very so hard. Kids yeah. struggle. It's like, you know, trying to force yeah. them to breathe through a, a very narrow opening. And, you know, we often think parents think this is your nose, the 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 nostrils, we call this the nares. And then the, the, maybe this part, the part that sticks out from your face, for those of you who are listening, um, that, what did JJ say? This is like one third of the, yeah. if that, of the whole nasal passage that does all the work to humidify, purify, and, and, um, um, filter the air. And by the way, he mentioned Macau and his books are the oxygen advantage and Bottega breathing. And, and I think Nestor did a really amazing job in the book, breath, breathe, breath, 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 where he literally put silicone plugs in his nose to force mouth breathing and experience what that nasal disuse really felt like. And it was awful. So that any of you who read the book, that's a memorable few pages, right? He called it a heinous experiment. Heinous is the word he used, yeah. That's, that's, a, that's a serious amount of negative right there. <laughs> heinous. heinous. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. Oh, that's funny. Um, so, so, so here's something else that's really fascinating about that we don't know enough about, but I just love this concept, uh, sort of. Um, that is, they have proven that there are... Uh, electric signals that go from certain cells on our, our nose mucosa, the inside part of our nose, and they send electrical signals to the, uh, to the middle of our brains. 
to all the parts of the middle of our brains, to the parts that control our heart rate and our breathing and our autonomic nervous functions, our body functions, and also to our emotional centers and to our thinking centers. And those electrical signals, now they don't know what they do, but they've proven un, un, without controversy that they exist. So if we think about that, then the brain is depending on nose breathing to get some kind of electrical signals to these critically important parts of our brain. I don't think we should deny the brain those signals. And, uh, and, if, and we don't know that it, that isn't a part of why children don't grow up to be as healthy as they should be if they're mouth breathers when they're really young. You know, that we can't do experiments on little kids like that. But uh, all we can do is, is, is use our brain, our own brains, and say, you know what? If our brain is getting those signals from our nose breathing, but not from our mouth breathing, there's got to be a good reason to make sure nose breathing happens. Absolutely. That's good enough for me. And, yeah. you know, it was interesting because we just filmed a podcast with Robert Lustig, and he's, of course, the metabolical guy. And in talking about that, he gave, he launched right into why chewing is important for oral development and nasal breathing. And and he, we talked about neurons a lot with him because he's a neuroendocrinologist. One of the things that we're acutely aware of is that the neurons are very sensitive to hypoxia, mm -hmm. which means if we don't have enough oxygen um, our neurons literally suffer. And then the microglial cells that do the repair of the brain are also aren't functioning very well with lack of sleep. So we start to see these kids suffer um, emotionally and cognitively. Can you talk a little bit about cognitive impairment, even in your adult population from uh, significant sleep apnea? They've had uh, definite studies now with what's called functional MRIs for the brain, where they can actually see what parts of the brain are are, act, are working. And they've uh, seen in people with obstructive sleep apnea and what's called intermittent hypoxia, which is an up and down movement of the oxygen levels in the blood system, more so than is typical. And so with intermittent hypoxia, the brain... Uh, lights up different parts of its brain for function than it does without intermittent hypoxia. And as they've traced down those areas, then we see d deficits in emotional control, deficits in uh, learning capability. So we think about somebody who spends decades with this intermittent hypoxia because they just don't breathe very well and wonder whether their brains are going to respond to a daily challenge the same way that they would have responded if they hadn't spent decades with this hypoxia. What there uh, is ongoing experiments to see, well, what if we restore that to normal? And uh, as they've looked at that, what they have been able to see is that people in their fourth, fifth, and sixth decades of life once the oxygen levels are returned to normal, some of the symptoms of cognitive decline that none of us want to have are, are seeing uh, recovery. We haven't set, uh, shown that uh, treating uh, adult obstructive sleep apnea recovers uh, somebody who's already declined back to normal. We haven't seen that, but we've seen better um, results over a relatively long period of time, a few years at least, 10 years, of people who have had it treated and then their brains are responding better than their peers who haven't had it treated. Well, so what we do know is sleep, just restoring sleep helps, right? We know sleep deprivation causes brain fog. But if you look at Bredesen's work and everybody else's, they basically say, if you already have brain damage from a number of lifestyle related things, it's hard to get that back. You can't start with a brain with Swiss cheese and hope to make it whole. You got to you got to start earlier, which is why we have been involved with kids. Speak to the, um, and so you're talking about cognitive deficit, which is hard enough, but then you talk about behavior. So little kids who struggle with sleep deprivation because they can't breathe well, instead of being sleepy all day like we are, they're sleepy on the inside, but they fidget a lot to stay awake. And that is a behavior um, and they they don't they're not capable of paying as close of attention and following along. So sometimes they get labeled and even diagnosed as ADHD. And I, I think that the current uh, 
uh, projection is about 37% of kids with an ADHD diagnosis is a sleep-related breathing disorder that was misdiagnosed. And instead of, um, you know, instead of addressing that, they give them a, a hyper, a stimulant to try to help them cope with ADHD. Can you talk a little bit about, uh, more about what we think is going on. Why did why do we why do why do kids behave differently when they're sleepy? Do, do you have any idea? Oh man, I wish we had some really solid science on that one, but we don't. What we have is a lot of good observation because it's so difficult to do uh, experiments on little kids and and come up with what we think of for adults as proper science, uh, randomized control trials, and all the things that scientists look for to stand on for as facts so that we can make medical decisions or recommendations. What we think about for little kids, and the reason I think, now I have some theories about this, but but what I take from my um, study of this is that pa pediatricians have, have patterns and they recognize patterns in little kids. And uh, a, a child is brought into the pediatrician's office because of misbehavior. And that child's, re or the report that they get from that parent Sounds just like the last thousand kids this pediatrician has seen, right. and these these pills worked for those other kids. So let's give them some more pills, and out they go. And uh, and so that pattern's hard to break. You talked about ha uh, mouth breathing uh, habits. We all have habits, and ped pediatricians have the same habits. And and not that they're not trying to be good doctors, it's just that they see the same pattern over and over again. So the, one of the keys to this, I think, I, I don't want to let them off so easy, though, sleep, they, uh, Steve, they don't they want they want to be good doctors, but they need to learn more about airway. True I mean, that. They, yeah. they need to ask better questions of our pediatricians. If you're bringing your child in um, and your dentist doesn't necessarily involved in airway and your pediatrician isn't involved in airway, it's up to you, brave parents, to ask the right questions. Yeah, that your whole your book is filled with parents advocating for lifetime health issues by asking questions, being persistent and, and not being satisfied with the same answers that your, you know, the parents before that came before you got. Um, so one of the things that I want to uh, bring up though, is in adults, we diagnose what have been labeled sleep disorders. Well, you know what, the nothing a physician does outside of a, of a hypnotic medication does anything to promote sleep. What we want to do is we want to promote an easy physiology, an easy interaction with the world, and that's an open airway and 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 good breathing. Then the body takes care of sleep the way it, it needs to. Love and it. that's the thing we have to do for little kids because they don't have a sleep problem. The problem they have is they don't have a resting problem. They don't have a physiologic reset uh, that's working for them. And so our goal is not to allow the same thinking that happens for these 40 and 50 year olds um, be applied to four and five year olds. What we have to do is think, well, what's going wrong in their lives? And what's going wrong is they're not resting well. They're not resting well because they're being interrupted because they can't breathe well. And, and if we can help them breathe better, then the body will take care of sleep the way it needs to. And, and so we don't have to think about, are we helping these kids sleep? We have to think about, are we helping them breathe? And the, the diagnosis is uh, restricted breathing. And why is that happening? It's because of allergies. It's because of, of bad habits, like you said. It's because of structure. So we have yes. to address the true diagnosis. I 100% I agree. Let's talk about um, anyone, children or adults, who miss out on sleep. What does that do to metabolism, metabolic health, in terms of uh, weight gain, uh, you know, hormone, like, diabetes, all of that. Let's talk a little bit about it. Well, you mentioned Robert Lustig. I'm, not, I'm, I'm, I'm hesitant to talk about met metabolism after you talk to him. You address it very well in your book. So I know you know it. I do too. I just, you know, you don't need to, to cite the studies, but what we know about people who don't get enough sleep, you know, I, I in, empirically, you would think it makes perfect sense that if you didn't sleep that much, you'd be burning more calories and you'd be actually skinnier. It turns out it's just the opposite. So what do we know about that? Well, our bodies are trying to maintain homeostasis, which is a, the healthiest way that we normally function. And if we disrupt that by any, any means, and it could be lack of food, it could be a lack of water, it could be a lack of sleep, it could be a lack of oxygen, all anything that's disruptive to that, the body has to compensate. 
and when it and it tries to compensate in a, a ways that is available to them to the body and so if you have a lack of restfulness a lack of uh, oxygen levels to the key parts of the brain to control how our bodies function then the compensation that happens is that it uh, changes what the hormone levels are that drive our normal functions like eating and uh, what the scientists have shown is that it changes a, a hormone that tells us that we're full enough. It changes a hormone that tells us whether we're hungry. Leptin and when those, and ghrelin, uh, those leptin are the and two. Ghrelin, yeah, the two hormones. But really think about, for the audience, think about, you know, do you feel hungry or do you feel, and when you eat, do you feel full? And if those things are out of balance, then you may be hungrier you may feel hungry when your body doesn't need more calories you may not feel full when you've taken in plenty uh, to get yourself through the next period of time and if those things stay out of balance you're going to take in more calories than you need you're not going to and you're going to end up creating a habit of eating too much food and those things can contribute to obesity and Maybe then also for the audience if you think that when you're sleepy you and and feeling sluggish and feeling icky if you think that you reach for comfort foods foods that you know aren't so good for you the things that are quick to metabolize that melt in your mouth like donuts and cookies and um you know it it, it is absolutely the research is very clear that that is true when we're sleep deprived we tend to eat uh, a lower quality of food which is not as good for our metabolism and it's a vicious cycle Right. You, you you take in more carbohydrates and less food that's harder to digest, like proteins yeah. and fats. Yeah. Simple processed carbs. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And so and then there, you know, there's we can't get away from talking about some really bizarre things that happen during sleep because of brain dysfunction called parafunctions. And sleepwalking is a parafunction, for example, but sleep eating is a parafunction. And um one of the things that's fun about this profession is you you start learning about uh, complex uh, physiology like sleep and you realize when that goes south and and things go weird uh, it gets c sometimes kind of you know bizarre and yeah. yeah people will get up and they'll eat whatever's in the kitchen they won't eat just the cereal they'll eat the cereal box and uh, because they don't have they have no brain control over what's going on and and these are things that you know of course dentists aren't going to treat any of this stuff but but we what we can do is think why would the body need to do that and, and maybe it's because they're not getting those that homeostatic restful sleep that they're supposed to. And what's the most common reason for that? It boils down to our most powerful reflex, which is to breathe. And uh, our dental, dentist's role uh, doesn't have to be involved with their nature of their sleep or what's going on with how often they much they spend in in dreaming sleep or light sleep. That that we don't control that. All we can do is help the the patient have a nice open airway, so they don't have to work hard to breathe, so their brains get enough oxygen at nighttime, and and then we just let the body heal itself from there. It's so powerful to return to homeostasis that we don't have to do a ton to help them out. So it we can be as complicated as as we want to be. I'm a, I'm total geek about this. I love reading about these things, but but if we're going to impact our whole profession and have our profession impact all of the community health that we can, we can't make it as complicated as what I like to think it is. Uh, we have to make it as easy as what is can be part, of, part of everyday dental practice. And which, we need parents to be able to identify these things too and right. bring it to our attention. So that, cause we're often in the dental chair, you're looking for cavities of my kid. My kid have cavities. That's what you're, that's what you think you're going for. Instead of saying, you know what? My kid's having difficulty breathing and sleeping and wondering what you might be able to do to help me. Or we notice that um, he's mouth breathing all the time. And here's a video of him snoring. Snoring is not okay for kids. So we need parents. I also think in the chapter on sleep, Steve, I do address sleep hygiene and I want to mention it because, you know, you and I are very um, much engrossed in this, um, in this area of structure, but there are also lots of families that just don't allow for enough sleep and good sleep sleeping circumstances where they feel like there has to be noise playing or a television going, even in the parents' bedroom, they play a TV or they have white 
they have night lights or they have noisemakers or they have, we want cool, dark and quiet environments. And clean. And what? And clean environments. And clean environments. The other thing we want to make sure of is that we give kids adequate amount of time to sleep. If they're having a hard time waking up in the morning, ask yourself first, did I give, did they get enough time for sleep? Look at in the, in the, in the uh, brave parent book about how much time do, does a kid need sleeping a lot. And so if you're, you haven't allowed enough time, that's one thing. And if, if you've allowed enough time and they're waking up dead tired, there is an airway problem. There's and, a problem. Yeah. And uh, uh, parents need to be curious as well. Because uh, an early study that really says it well says that uh, even kids with big time breathing problems go through long periods of night uh, the, during the night where they breathe just fine. And so as you ask your parents, uh, well, would you please go in and look at your child breathing while they sleep? And they come back and say, well, yeah, I checked in on them. They were doing fine. Well, you know, and you highly suspect there's something going wrong. You have to help the parents understand that there are, you know, even though kids with terrible breathing will have periods where they do fine. So they just have to be curious and get in there a little bit more frequently and listen more carefully. Use one of the monitors. It's so easy now to get a monitor that can report out uh, breathing sounds and breathing patterns. And so let's use some of the technology we have available to monitor these little kids. And Which one would you recommend? Well, you can use Snorlab as an app. It's just a measuring a, a device for air, for, uh, for easy. sound. You plug in your phone, you lay it down, and it, and in the morning you get a snore report. Yeah, and you and can listen. You can listen. There's there's new ones all the time that are using mo movement. They're using sounds. They're using um, vibration of uh, in the bed uh, to see okay what's going on during sleep. And I think that's going to be the future going forward is to be able to monitor for quality, not just time of sleep, but quality of sleep. And that's what we have to look for. So it's not about whether the child is goes to bed at eight o'clock at night, or it's about what, what they're doing at, new, at midnight or one or two. Are they able to rest well? Yep. You know, like Kevin Boyd uh, says, you know, they have to be quiet and dry. What's the other one? Quiet, dry, and still. Um, so they have to breathe without sound. They have to be quiet, be still, so they don't tear up their bed covers, and they have to be dry, so they don't sweat and they don't, you know, have bed, wet. bed wetting. Yeah, bed wetting is a real telltale sign that there's a, you know, beyond after potty training years that there's a there's a problem. Right. Um, we could talk about about antidiuretic hormone and about why that is, but um, it definitely is a sign. You know, one of the things that I like to do as a parent is I like to stay away from alarms because alarm literally alarms the body and alarm clock takes you from deep sleep to awake just like that and it stimulates all kinds of cortisol and and epinephrine I mean it's, it's just it's an alarm it's like you all of a sudden someone walked in your house right now with a gun that's what it does to your body and so hitting snooze all the time and giving yourself another alarm 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 does create uh, replicable patterns of alarm in your brain and can actually um, create more anxiety reactions through the day. But I, I also um, think it's important time for a parent to come up. If it's time for a child to wake up and they're not awake, first of all, note to self. Second of all, maybe put a hand on their foot and say, hey, honey, morning, morning, and sort of observe their behavior. If you're seeing a really groggy kid or a kid that you cannot arouse by just touching them and sort of shaking a foot, don't get right up next to them because that could scare them if they wake up and see your face right there. But um, observing their behavior when they wake up and sort of saying, what else can we do to create better sleep? So they're waking up naturally rested um, and have a better day at school. And it doesn't have to be an absolute either, because we have variations in our in our sleep quality, and it's okay to be sleepy one day, uh, you know, out of a, out of several, but it's not okay to be sleepy all the time. And it, so, don't let uh, parents shouldn't be able to to write that off as well. You know, it's just a teenager, it's just a you know a nine year old that's sleepy. They're all sleepy. 
That's not necessarily true. There's a lot of kids that do do well through the nighttime and they wake up. Sure, it takes a, you know, we don't instantly become awake and alert, but it shouldn't be a long process. You know, they should Some be. Some kids need more sleep than others and you'll see it among siblings. And the idea that bedroom time should never be a punishment, you know, that you're basically saying, you know, bed is good. Sleep is great. This is what we need to be healthy. It feels good on our bodies, right? So the idea that we don't say, oh, you get an earlier bedroom time, that sort of FOMO, fear of missing out is a big deal with kids, right? So we could all have the same bedroom time, which means what do you do in your bedroom? You can look at a book, can't watch TV, can't have your cell phone. You can look at a book. You can make up a story with your stuffed animals. You can, whatever you want to do, but it's bedroom time. And then sleep comes when it comes so that you're not saying one child has to go to sleep bed earlier because another child, because they require more sleep. Does that make sense to you guys? Well, what I think we're, uh, what's evolving is we're turning the uh, family pattern into a health supporting family pattern. So mm -hmm. as opposed to just a, a behavior management pattern, it becomes Mama. a health promoting pattern. Like you said, make up a story with your stuffed animals. I love that. Yeah. Yeah, I love that. I love what, the way you put that health promotion pattern, health promoting pattern. That's awesome. Lauren, what has been your experience with your kids' sleep? Got any questions for the experts? Steve's right here. Well, I was curious because I know you mentioned, you know, when we were talking about uh, the wetness during night and we were talking about bedwetting, um, my four-year-old specifically, he's always been a very heavy sweater when he sleeps. Is that associated with this as well? The, there's a balance between two parts of our of our physiology called the sympathetic nervous system where we're you know, ready to go and, and active and the parasympathetic system where we're um, calm and relaxed mm -hmm. and our body's regenerating. We need both. We need to balance those. We have both of those going on through the nighttime. But when you have too much of one or the other, then the, uh, the sweating comes with the parasympathetic part. Because your your body is saying, okay, I need to calm down now. I need to get back to normal temperature. I need to be able to um, to get back to a a, call, a, a steady process. Mm -hmm. So if you're spending too much time in sympathetic system, however, that means that you're going to overcompensate in parasympathetic, and uh, so too much sympathetic time is um, can be roused up by bad breathing. Can be a uh, too warm of a room. It can be too many blankets. It can be all kinds of things like that that are indicative of calm sleep. And uh, and so that, like Susan was talking about screen time, if they're watching the wrong thing, if they're spending too much time, you know, it, it, there's no part of it that is one thing that causes that. Yeah. Now, if everything seems perfect, you know, and nothing seems out of the ordinary. I'm sure there are medical conditions that cause um, sweating at nighttime, night sweats. But um, but I'm not sure that we that any pediatrician would um, jump on an exotic diagnosis if there wasn't uh, elimination of some of the more common reasons. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, he's definitely a mouth breather, moves around a lot in his sleep, all of that too. So, Kevin Boyd, quiet, dry, and still. So two, uh, zero for two there. So I don't know about quiet, Martin. <laughs> so so what, that, what this says, Lauren, you know, as a, as a, if you were an uninformed parent walking into Dr. Maple's office and saying, you know, go into you know, your interview process, you say, oh, by the way, my four-year-old moves around a lot and sweats a lot while they, and while they, and mouth breathes. Susan would say, you know, something has to be looked into. Mm -hmm. and, and we don't know exactly what that is yet. Take some evaluation. But that's not right. Mm. And uh, mom, you need to be persistent to figure out what's wrong here mm. so that we can make sure that four-year-old turns into a 40-year-old with maximum health. Yeah. And, you know, I know we've we've talked about this multiple times in podcast episodes with guests, but I just think it's so important to drill home to any parent listening that to talk to your, den your dentist about this. Mm -hmm. Because immediately, and I hope they know. always my pediatrician, right? Like, that's what I think of with those things. Like, I, before meeting you, before hearing the guest, like, I, I just never would have thought go to your dentist with right. these issues. So, just yeah, really we're the ones, you know, I, I, I've said this before, Lauren, and I'm not sure I've said it on the podcast, but like, it wasn't until like the late 1700s that we separated the body into systems and gave all the specialists their areas to study. 
And when they go to medical school, when students go to medical school to learn about sort of a snapshot of all these before they pick their residency, right? They can take a residency in family practice or something, but they can also, you know, go into cardiology or go into surgery or go into, you know, pulmonology. What they missed out was uh, they don't really get any education in the mouth mm -hmm. and the mouth uh, looking at the architecture of the mouth and the back of the throat through the mouth gives us a, a, a huge window of opportunity to look at, are they tracking for a good airway and good breathing? And that's something that um, because physicians don't even really know what a healthy mouth looks like, they, they literally look right from the lips to the back of the throat. And I think they're just looking at tonsils, but I don't think they're really looking at the mouth. So we've got work to do to educate across the aisle. But in the meantime, we have work to do to educate our own profession. And I'm going to put Steve on the spot and me maybe, but we're, you know, people like you, Lauren, mm -hmm. exactly like you said, Susan, oh my gosh, reading your book, I realized my child has an airway problem. I live here. Where do I take my child? Mm -hmm. This has become a real issue for us because I know, you know, it, Steve and I know 25 amazing people you could go to throughout the country, but not everybody can buy a plane ticket every, you know, couple of weeks and go off to to these yeah. people so what do we do Stephen? there's probably more than 25 good people but i mean we're we're limited what are we doing to help people find ways stimulate our profession to learn but also find good resources if you are listening and all of a sudden you realize my child is that child mm -hmm. yeah and that's that's the susan there is no assault that hasn't been solved yet but, I know. but here, here's what's <laughs> yeah. in process and, and what's, what's what's important uh, is something you said, and that is have the moms get curious when they read Brave, Brave Parent, when they read uh, Sleep Wreck Kids, when they read any of these great resources that are coming out. Uh, uh, Kelly Richardson's new book, The Very Stuff He Knows. What a great the Shereen's, the, What's Shereen's called again? The um, Eat Sleep Right. Sleep 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 yeah. Right. So when they read these books, they're going to go knock on the doors of these doctors' offices, pediatricians, uh, dentists, and say, "Okay, I read this. They said I'm so supposed to ask you questions." And then the 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 healthcare providers are going to have to look back and realize, "I don't know enough," and that's what I'm actually depending on to happen to drive dentistry into uh, becoming the first line uh, primary care dental surgeons for these little kids, because um, that's not going to happen by um, uh, from the inside. Now, the American Dental Association is fully behind this project. They helped me uh, by saying yes. They helped me uh, form the ADA Children's Airway Initiative. We just had an event a few weeks ago with Shireen and Sharon and, and Stanley Liu and Eric Phelps, an orthodontist who believes in all this. And we're going to do it next year again. We're going to do it every year at least and do more things. You've been doing this for how many? Four years now, right, Steve? Four years now, yeah. Yeah, yeah we had our first conference in 2018. I was so, at that one. Yeah, it, it changes slowly, but it changes. And the so when a dentist says, oh, I got to learn more because mo too many moms are asking me these days and they turn to the ADA, we're going to have resources. Endeavor is put together to, to form resources. And so what we can start to, to develop is a place where people can go and say, okay, I need help. Who in my area can help? And uh, the American Academy of Physiologic Medicine and Dentistry, American Academy of Oral Systemic Health, uh, groups that you know you and I are both part of, Endeavor, uh, the ASA, there, there's a number of these uh, groups that are forming that a simple Google search will be able to say, okay, I can connect with them and find a dentist in my community. What he's but, really saying is Steve and I are working our ass off to make this possible. Right. But we need your help and we need you as brave parents to ask better questions of your dentists. And when they say, or their or your physicians, when they say, I don't really know, let me learn and get back to you. That's exactly what we want them to say. We, we want them to, to walk out feeling like I have a learning deficit here. I need to fill. I need to learn more and get more engaged because once you learn it, you don't unlearn it. Once you see it, once you see these problems in kids' facial developments and, and habits, you don't get to unsee them anymore. Then you start to see them everywhere. 
Which is very encouraging too. when I think about the future of my grandchildren, but as my boys continue to get older, I mean, they were three and six when you and I started out, you know, like it's scary to think that there aren't any local solutions right now when now is the time that they need it, unless these organizations are going to start paying for the travel as well for people who desperately want the care. I'll pay for your travel, bring them to my office and you can stay at my house and I'll cook for you. I love it. So, so it does take the brave parents, though, because it's not in our, uh, it, it's slowly becoming part of our culture to question healthcare authority. Yeah. And dentists have a, such an advantage because we form relationships with our patients over many, many years, generations, and we become trusted advisors to families. Pediatricians, especially these days, have, what, seven minutes with a family. And the next time you go to that clinic, you may, your pediatrician may not be there anymore. And so it's just not this. I don't think it has the potential to be the same. But when a brave parent goes into a, a pediatrician's office or a dentist's office and says, I have questions because I've read this or I know this now or I'm, I'm, I'm curious about my child. And they hear, you know, I don't know enough about that, but I'm, you know, you're the 10th person to ask me today. I'm going to find out and get back to you. There's the right person. But if the the other one might say, you know, I've heard about that, but I don't think that's very important or they'll dismiss you in some way. Mm -hmm. Well, that takes even more bravery to be able to say, I'm not satisfied with that answer. I may need to find a different healthcare provider. I may need you to do better than what you're doing for me right now. And people aren't used to saying that to healthcare providers, healthcare authorities. Mm -hmm. But I think it's because it's changing. People are taking more charge of their own health. Uh, consumer technology is helping us with that because we can self-assess better than we were able to before, and we can walk in with a little bit of data and cure and courage. And you know, and Susan, I love your book because it it does nothing but and. Uh, generate more courage in families uh, to go in and say and demand a, a better answer and that's what our part is that i i almost feel and this is a this is a cynical viewpoint probably that i shouldn't share but i'm going to i feel like our healthcare system's imploding a little bit we have so many sick people from lifestyle related uh illness and we have during covid we had a, a pretty major exodus of a lot of people that were overwhelmed leaving a few good docs to do a lot of heavy lifting. It's very hard to get in with the best of the best. If you find you want to leave your, your pediatrician because you know, you can do better. Um, be, be, don't leave before you have someone else. Cause it's hard to get in with the good ones. Right. Yeah. And, and, you know, and there's not, they're not doing enough to provide more uh, family practice doctors, more pediatricians, more, pediatric dentists, although that pediatric dentists are actually becoming more and more common. And I think it's pediatric dentists and um, orthodontists uh, and general dentists who see kids, uh, like Kevin says, these are the two leaders of our dental profession that's going to make the biggest difference in healthcare. But this is this takes a while. This is the long game. I We're, also uh, want to remind you, I was speaking, I can't remember, Greater New York or something, and I had three pediatric uh, dentist who just finished residency and after I got done speaking came up and said where do we start we learned none of this in school this was two years ago so real realistically the pediatric dentists are not necessarily astute in airway I keep saying throughout the book you want an airway astute dentist and I think the pediatric dentist will get there but the American Academy of Pediatric Dentistry has not strongly supported it now there are some like the Southwest group, um, we're getting more and more airway speakers there, but I mean, it's, it's coming, but again, it's not a guarantee that just because they're a pediatric dentist, they're going to be astute in this. So just wanted to mention it. Yep. Brave and per persistent, Cur curious, brave and persistent. There we go. There's three good words for brave all of the title. <laughs> well, there's your next book, curious, brave and persist persistent. Yeah. Be the advocate for your family. I love that. I yeah. love that. Yeah. yeah. So, um, uh, because, because yeah, there's, there's just not enough, but we're reaching, you know, there'll be a tipping point. And when that tipping point comes, it'll become part of our profession. Mm -hmm. So Susan, you and I are pushing the boulder uphill before we reach that tipping point. I haven't gotten there quite yet, but because the institutions and the dental schools haven't, haven't, re haven't realized their role yet, but they will. ADA is uh, making uh, headway that way. And we, we have them behind us. And so, so that's I just wanted to happen in our lifetime, Steve. 
in our professional lifetime. Wouldn't that be nice? You're 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 young. You're, you're I'm like right. You. I'm the same age as you. Come on. <laughs> you're not young. I, I I got I had this meme this week and said it's so weird to be the same age as old people. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, feel old, but old is you know again part of brave parents is to guarantee that your kids' health span equals their lifespan, like Steve's and like mine. Mm-hmm. You know when we're working at this level, we're also taking good care of ourselves, and that's what you want for your kids. You want to give them all the tools to be able to advocate for their own health. And you're setting the tone, you're showing them how, and you're walking the talk. So again, address your own sleep issues. If you're a snorer, you have sleep apnea, you, someone says you're gasping, your kids, if you're tired all the time and cranky and you wake up with a coffee mug that says, don't talk to me until I'm finished with this. You wake up and drug yourself to be awake. So your kids see that that's what we do when we're sleepy is we just take a drug. I mean, this, these are all things that we have to be very careful about because they're they're watching us all the time. You know, I'll tell you, I'm actually two weeks in without coffee now, which I used to be a big coffee person. And it was because almost every morning that I would have it, my four-year-old would like sniff my mug and be like, I'm going to drink coffee when I get older. I'm like, you don't have to, buddy. You don't have to. But it was because he kept doing that that I'm like, all right, I'm off of this officially. For that exactly. Teach our kids how to be addicts. I said it in there. You know, if you if you're modeling that behavior, trying to 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 sleep, numbing yourself with alcohol, waking up with or cigarettes or whatever it is, any addiction, it's we show our kids how it's done. Yep. Yep. So. Let's be addicted to good things. Let's be addicted to taking a walk after dinner. Let's be addicted to moving every day, like you said, Susan. Let's be addicted to carrots instead of you know carrot cake. Yeah, I mean, let's let's do those things. Let's, let's be addicted to good stuff. I love, I love it. it. I'm just going to go get some carrots and celery and hummus right now as a snack before we do our next podcast. Steve, I I, I know I've said this a million times, but I'll say it to publicly. I have a debt of gratitude to you for all the work you're doing for, for our profession and for your friendship and for all that you're teaching me, um, a mentor like no other. And I'm super, super grateful. I, I, I often think if Steve Carson's is involved, shit's going to happen. We're going to get this done. It, seriously. Like I'm, you know, who, who can move the ADA? That's like literally uh, almost unmovable. The larger the organization and the older it is, the harder it is to move. So um, how we're doing that without even, you know, moving right past the pediatric dentist and the orthodontist and going right to the ADA and saying, let's do this is incredible. So we'll get there eventually. I know we spent a lot of time talking about where we are not, but we are making a lot of progress around the world and uh, getting the world. All it takes is the next parent to be curious, brave, and persistent. And then that'll, that'll change, that changes the world. It That's really does. Yeah, you know that starfish analogy, right? With a little yeah. kid, someone came up and the little kids tossing starfish and the old man said, what are you doing? You're not going to help the situation. There's millions of starfish. He said, I did for that one. And that's really the point. So if you're watching this and you're not a parent, you're a grandparent or a teacher or see kids of anywhere, you want to very politely, I know my team members are always like, look at this picture on Facebook. I so want to say your kid is an airway problem. Got to do it gently. But it would be nice if you can, you know, even like personal message and say, gosh, I, you know, I noticed you put, you put a, a, these little snoring videos. Those aren't cute. Those aren't funny. Those are significantly problematic. So again, we have to help raise our friends awareness too. You're, one of the phrases you came up with uh, that I love is, you know, there's no such thing as other people's children. And, and think about a, a terrible analogy where you see a child being abused in a grocery store or a, or a queue someplace, you know, and the parent is, is being mean to that child. And you think, what does what your conscience say? Your conscience says, I should intervene there. Now, there may be reasons not to, but you, but you clearly, anybody clearly has the feelings that something should be done to protect that child. Well, what if we thought the same way about ch- seeing a child who's mouth breathing? Yeah. That's an interesting thought. I love it. If we can get that word out. And I think Nestor's done a good job with that. And certainly we're helping. So 
So we're Thank both going to be at Airway Palooza coming up in, in December. I can't wait. That's, Lord, it's it's that's going to be a ton, ton of fun. So everybody watching this should tune into Airway Palooza as well. That's pretty cool. And Nestor will be speaking. I'm excited to be speaking with him, aren't you? Oh, baby. Yeah, yeah. I was talking to Lauren Gates yesterday about it. It's, it's going to be so fun. Pretty yeah. big deal. Yep. I love it. All right. Thank you, Steve, from Seattle Sleep Education and Endeavor and AAPMD and Collaboration Cures. And can I go on? All right. Thank you so much. Appreciate you. Bye now. Talk to you soon. Bye, Lauren. Bye. Thank you for listening to the Brave Parent Podcast with your host, Dr. Susan Maples, author of Brave Parent, and Lauren Eckert, founder of Burning Soul Press. Be sure to leave a podcast review and grab your copy of Brave Parent on Amazon or Audible or wherever you choose to buy your books. Bye for now.